Okay. So, class number 10. So, international taxes. Okay, so I guess I realized that the projector is not actually on, so maybe you can be, Anna, tech support over there. No. Looks like it's coming on now. Okay, so class number 10. Class number 10 is international taxes. And in the past, when I've taught this class uh, as a semester, we've kind of left the last section or the last class open, and people have just asked to talk about random things, and I'd cover whatever people wanted to talk about. Um, international taxes is usually a common topic, and so this time, since I was uh, reworking the materials for the whole semester, we just put together a class deck for tonight as well, so it's a little more structured. There's more content in this uh, deck that we're going to cover tonight. And you obviously know that I'm not going to test you on this. There's no more tests. So um, I guess what I would encourage you to, to do is throughout ask questions, right? Like what sounds interesting to you or what don't you understand? Because this should all be about intellectual curiosity and not about is this going to be on the test, right? <coughs> and um, as a general comment about international taxes, I mean, what you find at most big companies is that um, you know, take take some of the companies that have uh, presented here as guest speakers. You know, they typically have a provision person, and then they typically have international tax people, and they're not the same. And so, one of the, like the great challenges with doing a provision when it comes to international taxes is having the provision person gather the information they need from the international tax person about international taxes. And if you can find an international tax person that also is good with provisions, like that is a very rare uh, person. And, um, <clears throat> and if you have that skills, you will be very employable. Um, it, it, it tends to be one or the other, but not both. Okay, so uh, you in the audience as you're listening tonight think, I'm the provision person, um, but if you're going to be successful doing provisions at a larger company, what you really can't do is think, I'm not an international tax person, therefore I can't get engaged in the international tax piece of the provision. I just need to be told what to do, and I will sit here and do the provision based on what I'm told, right? I see that a lot. And um, again, you know, I think if I'm you and I want to challenge myself in doing provisions, what, what you want to think is I want to know everything. I'm the provision person, right? Like I'm driving the bus. Everything that happens to the bus is me. And so, um, that means when it comes to international taxes, you usually have to ask a lot of questions, right? And, and I know people are afraid to ask dumb questions about things that are outside of their comfort zone, but for provision people, international tax tends to be this kind of thing that they're sometimes scared of and don't want to admit it. But my kind of Dr. Phil advice on this is to, you know, not be so nervous and ask a lot of questions and make sure that when you do a provision that has international tax stuff, you understand the why and not just that it was done that way last year, or that's because what the international tax person told you. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, so when we talk about the global provision, there are really four components of a global provision, and you have to think of them uh, separately. And so sometimes when people talk about international taxes and provision, I'm not even sure I know what they're talking about, right? And so it's pretty important to define, like, what do you mean when you say international tax? Do you mean things like subpart F, which is really a U.S. tax issue, but it involves cross-border investments? Or do you mean a foreign sub and the foreign country taxes and how to do provisions for that? Because that's totally different. Or do you mean um, what happens if my foreign sub pays a dividend? because that's different. And so the first section of the slides is really just going to break down for you when, when somebody says international taxes and provisions, that they could be talking about four things, or maybe more, but the slides break it down into four different things they might be talking about. Yeah. And so I want you to start with the most basic question, which is when somebody says international, what do they mean? Like What, what exactly international-wise are we talking about? Okay. And the four things are listed here on the... Um, on the slide, and we'll go through each of those. But I want to make sure that you understand this diagram for starters. <clears throat> so 
because I'm going to use this diagram in each of the next uh, handful of slides. Okay, so this is our U.S. company, right, that is filing an 1120 paying U.S. taxes, right? So USP is U.S. parent. Our, our FORCO is going to be what I'll call our CFC, right? And so for those of you who are somewhat experienced with international taxes, CFC means controlled foreign corporation. And that's not a tricky term. It's a foreign corporation you control, right? And the important thing about that it's a foreign corporation is it is taxed at a foreign jurisdictional rate, depending on whatever jurisdiction it's in, right? So this is 28%. So they're in some country where the tax rate is 28%, okay? And the assumption is that their currency that they're doing business in is pounds, okay? So this country must be UK. And the UK tax rate has dropped since this um, example was put together, but you get the idea that we have a legal entity in the UK paying taxes at UK rates, doing business in pounds, just like a normal UK company would do. Okay. <clears throat> the key with the term CFC means that that corporation is not subject to US tax. Right? That company is subject to foreign tax, but the earnings of this company aren't subject to US tax unless they are distributed up to US parents. Okay, or there's some rule like sub F or 956. And if I go a little too fast on some of those terms, it's up to you whether you stop and ask me, but some of this you're just going to have to know a little bit about international tax to make sense of the topic. But as a general matter, foreign co is going to be subject to foreign company taxes, but not U.S. taxes. Okay. Our um, FBR is short for our foreign branch. And the foreign branch is an operation that is, in this example, doing business in a country where the currency is the euro, and the tax rate is 34%, right? Like that could be France. And a branch entity, whether it's a true branch or it's, t it's taxed as a branch, which I'm going to assume it's just taxed as a branch, and that's what this circle represents. Okay, the, um, let me just define that. The circle means you're taxed locally, right? You're still foreign business, doing business in the foreign jurisdiction. The foreign jurisdiction wants to tax your profits, just like any other business. But the circle means that it is a flow-through entity for U.S. purposes. Okay, so you can make an election for flow th for for U.S. tax purposes to treat the FBR entity as if it's just flowing into the U.S. like it's a division of the U.S. or it's a branch. Okay, so if the term branch is not familiar, think division, right? Division connotates a an unincorporated segment of the operations, and this might be incorporated, but the idea is that it's just a subset of the USP based on this tax election. Okay. So for those of you that this is new to, there's a concept in the US called check the box. And you can file a form with the IRS and say, for this entity, I'm just going to check the box as to how I want it treated. I can treat it as a corporation that's not subject to US tax, or I can treat it as this branch example that's treated as a flow through. And you file a form and you check the box on the treatment you want. And once you did that, you've checked the box. Yep. So when most people say I, I have a check the box entity, it means I have a entity that is taxed locally, but treated as a flow through for US tax purposes. Okay. So that's confusing. I get it. All right, so we have three entities. We have U.S. parent, which is U.S. company filing a U.S. tax return. We have foreign co and FBR, which are <coughs> foreign businesses filing foreign tax returns, doing business in foreign currencies, one of which is not taxed in the U.S. and one of which is taxed in the U.S. Okay? Are we good? <coughs> 
So when you do your provision, I mean, if you, if you pull up a big company's org chart, it's going to look like this with lots more boxes, right? But sometimes the volume uh, makes it look complex, but it's probably some combination of these, uh, you know, these illustrated entities. I mean, you have U.S. companies filing U.S. taxes, you have foreign companies that are treated as corporations, and you're going to have foreign companies treated as divisions. Those three types of entities, very common. They're everywhere. Okay? And if you go to most um, Silicon Valley public companies, they will have all three. Okay, so if we break down that scenario with those three entities into the four types of taxes that we, we care about for this group, right? Well, the first one's easy. We've already been focused on it, right? And so that's just our U.S. tax on our U.S. operations. And that's the 10 steps that we already went through in the first six classes of the semester or quarter, right? So if you think, what taxes apply to this group? The first one is easy. It's USP's normal U.S. taxes. The second component of a tax provision for a group of companies like this is the non-U.S. tax on non-U.S. operations. Okay. okay, so now you have to pretend that you're a Brit, right? And all you care about, for example, is this company. Like, that's your world, right? If you're employed in the UK by this company and you're doing its taxes and its tax provision, you kind of think sometimes with your blinders on that all you're worried about is is your Forco, right? Your UK company. And if that was all you were thinking about, you would do a provision for Forco just like you did for the US. So you would calculate their current liability, you'd calculate their deferred liability, you'd come up with their provision, you'd do their rate rec, you book their entries, you'd do the UK provision just like you do any provision. It just happens to be in the UK. And sometimes it's confusing because they have funny rules. It's funny for us because we're used to what we're used to. And um, they have different addbacks or deductions or different perms and different temps. But the UK provision works mechanically just like the US provision does. Right? And so if somebody says, oh, I'm doing the UK provision, it's so hard. You'd be like, well, I don't know why it's so hard. It's, it's the same mechanics. There isn't a different set of ASC 740 rules because it's a foreign provision. It is the same current plus deferred equals total provision. And so, again, breaking down the I'm intimidated, I don't know what I'm doing thing, the, the foreign provisions tend to be much easier than the U.S. provisions because in, in all the jurisdictions of the world, the most complex one by far in terms of calculating the tax liability is the U.S., without a doubt. And, um, I mean, Switzerland, like, the tax return is, like, on a 3 by 5 card. I mean, it's really straightforward. So... Um, there are other things that make it difficult, but as a general matter, you shouldn't be intimidated just because it's a foreign country. It works the same. Okay. When, you, um, when you do a foreign provision, the key is to do everything in functional currency. Okay. And um, it's funny when you see small companies grow and they start doing their provisions for non-U.S. operations. It, I mean, a classic rookie move is to be doing non-U.S. provisions in dollars, right? Because we're in the U.S., we're doing the provision, we think dollars, we think everyone should think dollars, right? But that, I mean, that's a, f a foolish move. I mean, when you are employed by the U.K. company, and you may not be literally employed by the company, but if you put yourself in the shoes of, I am in the U.K., I'm doing the U.K. provision, that company, whatever its currency is, it's its currency for everything, including the tax provision. Okay? And so if you calculate that this company owes 100 pounds, and that's $150, let's say, if you just book $150 um, on the U.S. books, well, what happens when the company pays their tax three months later and it turned out to be the equivalent of $160? It's still 100 pounds. But now whatever you booked, it doesn't make any sense, right? And the UK people are like, we told you it was 100 pounds. It's still 100 pounds. I don't know why you're thinking dollars, because we in the UK, we do business in pounds. It's just that simple. And so you have to open your mind to the fact that around the world, people are using different currencies, and the tax provision is no different, right? They book their revenues in foreign currency. 
the books are expenses in foreign currency, provision is just another category of expense. So if you see a foreign provision and it's calculated in dollars, your antenna should go up and think, what is going on here? Is, is this right? Um, <clears throat> and the odds are it's not. I mean, some foreign companies can do business in dollars, and so you need to look out for that fact pattern. But in our example, where our functional currency is pounds, um, that our, our provisions should be done in pounds. And you'll know what a company's functional currency is based upon how they file their financial statements. So that, that is a gap threshold. It's not a tax question. And all you need to do is ask, <coughs> ask your accounting guys what the currency is, and then they can tell you. It's, that, it's straightforward. Okay. So if you do the provision in foreign currency <coughs> and then applying the local country tax rate, that's pretty much it. The provision is otherwise the same as everything you've learned in class so far. Right? When you uh, calculate the UK provision in this example, I mean, if you go telling them how to book a journal entry in dollars and you want them to book it on the local books, I'll bet they can't even book it in dollars. Right? Their general ledger is going to be set up in pounds. Mm -hmm. And if you start booking things at the US rate, that has no relevance to the UK. Right? So if you're thinking, I'm trying to figure out my UK payable, my UK deferreds, a UK provision, that's going to be at the UK rate. We'll, we'll worry later about whether there's any incremental US consequences, but for the moment, if you just think, I'm worried about the non-US provision, all you do is the same mechanics using the UK <coughs> currency and the UK rate. Okay? When you're, when you're doing these, I mean, these are some practical tips. When you're doing foreign country provisions, it is amazing how um, time-consuming foreign country provisions can be because oftentimes you're sitting in the U.S. and you're talking to somebody outside the U.S. and their concept of what you're doing is usually so far from your expectations of what you're doing that the, the risk of lost in translation is like 100%. And so um, I remember the... In fact, I have a, like a super, super funny story about their boss when we were doing non-U.S. provisions because their boss was arguing once about with a foreign controller and the foreign controller wouldn't book our entries. And um, we're like, book the entries. And they're like, I'm not booking the entries. And, and it's just amazing how um, the complexity with foreign provisions oftentimes is the communication between you, the provision person, and the finance people locally. I mean, it is, it is stunning how much time goes into that. Um, <clears throat> just as one example, the term provision um, in some foreign countries is not the same use of the word provision we think of, right? When I say provision, I think you think expense. When I say provision in many countries in Europe, that's the payable to them. That is the liability. So if you say, do you have a provision, they'll say, yeah, I have a liability on my balance sheet. Mm -hmm. And you'll be like, well, that's not your provision, right? But it is to them. And so you have to be amazingly like careful and slow and methodical when you're communicating because the simplest thing can take you completely off course. Okay. Um, the last bit down here is that in many countries um, there are multiple tax systems. So like in Germany, um, you know, they have a trade tax, which is a, a second layer of tax. Or in Italy, they have what this IRAP tax, which is. Um, you know, it's, it's a dual tax system. They have IRES, which is the income tax, and then they have IRAP, which is kind of an extra thanks for hanging out here type of tax. Mm -hmm. um, and they're calculated differently, but in total they, they make up the tax provision. And so you have to keep an eye for the multiple tax systems. Okay. All right, questions about that? Inside basis difference just means the um, deferred taxes that exist at the UK level. So if the UK has a bad debt reserve, then the UK has a DTA, right? If the UK has to add that back, like the US tax system, then in the future when that turns, you're going to save UK taxes because of the temporary difference. That's what the inside basis difference is. It's the same exact thing as when I say temp difference for a US provision, you would have thought, oh, it's a temp difference. Inside basis difference just means it's a temp item within the UK. And the reason that's relevant that it's inside is in a minute we're going to talk about outside. 
and outside means the U.S.'s investment in the U.K. So it's not a U.K. issue, it's a U.S. issue of the parent. Okay, that's outside. Inside just means inside the U.K. company, what temp items do they have for U.K. purposes? Okay? You guys are all like looking at me like I'm so happy this is not on the exam. Okay. Okay, so when you do a non-U.S. provision, in addition to just basic terminology things, like that provision example I gave you in terms of what that term means, one thing that you will encounter an unbelievable number of times in your career, I mean, I feel like it is just like Groundhog Day when I cover this topic with people at companies. When you're talking about... Um, foreign country provisions with local finance people and, and you're sitting in the US and you're doing a provision, what, what provision do you care about? You, you care about the provision that is going in your 10K, right? And to you, that's the only provision there is, right? Right, when we, you know, when I had you read the Microsoft uh, 10K for homework, the person doing the Microsoft provision cares about whatever that number is that ends up in the 10K. Like, that is the provision, right? As if there is only one provision. But that person's colleague in the UK is filing financial statements in the UK just for that UK entity. And when you talk to the UK person about their provision, they're sitting there with their UK hat on. They don't care what you're doing. They're sitting there with their UK hat on thinking, the provision is the provision that goes in my UK financial statements. Right? And the conundrum is that in the 10K, you use US GAAP, right? ASC 740. When you talk to your UK colleague about, hey, what provision is in your financial statements in the UK? He's not using US GAAP, right? That's why it's called US GAAP. It's not called US and UK GAAP, right? So that person is using a completely different set of rules to calculate the provision. And oftentimes there's a lot of similarities, but it's a different set of rules to calculate not only how the tax provision works, but how the financial statements as a whole work. So you might have different revenues for US GAAP and IFRS purposes. You might have different profits, right? You make $100 for US GAAP. When you call your UK colleague and say, well, what's on your financial statements? They might be like, well, I made 80 of profits. And you'll be like, well, why is it different? And the answer is that it's two different rules, right? Maybe for one, you, um, you recognize you know, prepaid revenue whenever you get a check, and then the other, you have to defer it until you earn it, or something like that, right? It could be just basic conceptual differences in how the accounting framework works. And so one just strikingly fundamental thing is when you're talking to your colleague outside the US and you talk about the provision, First thing you need to know is if, when you say provision, are we both talking about the P&L expense? And then you need to know, are we both talking about US GAAP or whatever their local reporting requirement is? And it is amazing how many times when you're talking to that UK colleague, they're thinking of their financial statements. And you're thinking, hey, I'm in the US, this is a big US public company, we're filing a US 10K, our stock trades on a US exchange, like get with the picture, the only thing that matters is the US, right? And, and I say that like jokingly, right? But there's a skill in making sure that you're um, being empathetic to whatever the other person's point of view is because they're thinking about their provision and their financial statements. Um, so just know that that's important. And so the purpose of this diagram is when, you, um, when you're thinking US GAAP provision over here, what normally happens is the local country starts by keeping their books in local GAAP. And there's lots of different local accounting systems, right? I mean, IFRS is a common one, um, but there's all sorts of different accounting rules. And if you call up your Korea guy or your Australia person, I mean, they're all keeping their books and their accounting rules because they're filing financial statements in their countries. And when the U.S. finance team says, hey, we need to do U.S. GAAP books, well, they need to do the conversion, right? So there's differences. 
Sometimes there's very few differences. Sometimes there's tons. I mean, I was work working with a company once where the left column of a spreadsheet was the local gap and the right was US gap. And there was just like a constant stream of columns between the two explaining how to get from one to the other. I mean, it was like my number. So know that as a process, your finance team is taking local accounts and converting it to US GAAP, and there should be a schedule of how they get it, how they convert it. Okay. Now, separately, when your local person does their tax return, they're not going to start with US GAAP and calculate their taxes based on US GAAP as a starting point. They're just starting with their local books. And they're going to calculate their tax liability on the return based on book tax differences. Okay. Now the key is that when you're, when you're doing a U.S. GAAP provision, you care that this is your starting point. This is your ending point. Everything in between you care about, but not really how many steps are in between. You care about this. Okay. So if somebody says, I have a U.S. GAAP expense of 20 for bad debts, let's say, and that 20 is not deductible on the tax return. It could be for one of two reasons. It could be because that 20 doesn't even exist in the statutory financials. So let's say, for example, that, let's say here that there's a $20 expense, but here there's not, and here there's not. So you might call up your UK friend and say, hey, what about that add back of bad debt reserves, right? Because I see that in my gap financials, but I don't see that deducted in my tax return. And that person is going to be like, I don't even know what you're talking about. There's no add back of bad debt reserves because they're focused on this difference, right? But when you're doing your provision, you're doing it on a US gap basis. So you worry you want to know that in the future when this gets written off presumably then these guys are going to book an expense and then you'll get a deduction and that timing difference even though it exists here that's a temporary item so most people would think well like my temp and perm items I can define only with respect to this line but my temps and perms are anything in that yellow two, two direction arrow line, anything that is a permanent or temporary difference between gap and the tax return, that affects your provision. So when people are talking to me about what's on their staff financials and, it's, and I can tell we're getting confused, mm -hmm. I'll just tell them, forget there is, even is a statutory financial report. Forget you even do local financials. Start with gap, that's all we care about figure out what's permanently different between gap and your tax return and what's a temp item between your US gap financials and tax return. And the local people will not like that. That is not how they think. They think local books to local tax. But just know, I mean, I must have spent hundreds of hours in my career explaining this concept of how to get from local to gap to tax return. And what underlies all that time and energy is not the complexity of the question, but the communication and the ability to like listen and understand each other. Because again, if you put yourself in that person's shoes, they're thinking all about their financial statements, how to do the UK books. And of course, you're just blindly thinking, all I care about is the US books. So you're just talking over each other, right? And so if you do work on foreign provisions, know that it's not that complicated. But this sort of communication issue, this is paramount. This is where you might spend 90% of your time doing a form provision. It's just clarifying how to get from gap to local to tax. Yeah? That might seem like really abstract, but just trust me. If you work on a form provision and it goes completely sideways because you can't communicate with the form person, this is why. One of, my, uh, one of my clients actually, they, um, they kept separate GLs for GAP and STAT purposes. So meaning you could go into their Oracle system and they would have one general ledger for Korean entity X that would be in US GAP. And then for that same entity, they would have a, 
second general ledger, which would do it in local GAP. And this general ledger, I remember this like this. I, I had a panic attack on this one because the differences were so massive. We couldn't figure out what was going on, and and um, it was the Korean entity, and our our English to Korean was not good, and. Um, so what we ultimately learned, we put the two general ledgers next to each other and we, we just compared the balances in every row and there was like 4,000 rows. And I think every row was different. And we're like, holy crap, <laughs> right? This is not good, right? So we might have 4,000 perm or temporary differences. This is not good at all. So uh, wait, wait a second. I know how Oracle works. And the point is, is if they're posting in local GAP and then you're also posting in Korean, you're not posting two entries for each time they post. They're doing a conversion. No. They're making posts in Korean and they're posting in... No. What they were doing, and it took us a while to figure this out, was for U.S. GAAP purposes, this company was one that like closed really fast. It's the kind that announced their earnings like right after year end. Like You can't believe how fast they closed their books. So what they did for GAAP is they closed the books like three days before they did for local purposes. So if their year end was December 31st, they would close the books for GAP on the 28th. Mm -hmm. But then for the local books, they ran it to the 31st. So there was just three days of activity that just affects everything, right? I mean, if you're a business with high volume, mm -hmm. it just runs through all your accounts. And so it was nothing more than our differences actually happened to be that we just use different tax years, basically. I mean, it's just a, it's, it's a small difference. Mm -hmm. So it's not that like one country makes you use five-year depreciation and one uses seven. It's just that we made a practical decision to close our books faster for GAP and just take the rest of the three days and put them in next year. What a mess, right? Well, it's like one big count. Right. So when you're doing your provision, you're like, okay, I'm starting with 362 days of GAP income, but now I'm paying tax on 365 days of income. So what is that difference? Is that a perm or temp, right? And so that's not a technical tax issue. That's just a mess, right? And you just need to figure out how you're going to deal with that. So that example is a lot of times how foreign provisions work. It's just that goofy, messy stuff, right? What is happening? How do you get from local books to the tax return and to gap? And if you can explain the three data points and how you get around, everything else falls into place. Okay. But if you try to sit there and explain to people why there's a deferred tax asset for something that's in here, man, that is a good skill. Like, I should put that on the exam, you know, like stand in front of class and teach me, like, why that's a deferred. Because there's no doubt it is a deferred, but the ability to articulate why is a tricky question. Okay? Okay. So, so we covered so far U.S. tax on U.S. operations, non-U.S. tax on non-U.S. operations, and now we're going to deal with the, uh, the middle ground. Okay. So if, um, if I have an entity like FBR, my foreign branch entity, remember I said that I'm going to treat this thing as a flow-through entity. So therefore, if FBR makes $100, or 100 euros, what's going to happen on my U.S. tax return? Okay. So the same in France, the French entity makes 100 euros of profit. Mm -hmm. I, f I filed my form that checked the box to treat that thing as a flow through into the U.S. What happens on my U.S. return? What do I do? Well, you're jumping way ahead, but go to like the very beginning. You include income in your return. How much income do you include in your return? All the income. All the income. How much is income is that? Well, I said you, they made a hundred dollars, a hundred euros of profit. So, what do they put on their U.S. tax return? A hundred euro to the U.S. Right. So, how do you convert it? Based on based on an average rate, right? Right, so if the average rate for the year is 1.3 to 1, you would pick up $130 on your U.S. tax return, right? So, so why would anyone do this, right? That sounds kind of idiotic, right? I already paid tax in France, and now I made an election so that I'd be taxed again in the U.S., right? That sounds counterproductive. 
right? So why why would be why would people do that? You get the credit for the French for the French tax that you pay on the U.S. return. Right. So if the if everything goes according to plan, mm -hmm. if you paid thirty four cents on the dollar in tax in France, there's only one percent more in tax you have to pay in the U.S. if you're at a thirty five percent rate, right? And so treating this entity as a flow through is not that big of a deal. And now you can actually move cash back and forth without any significant consequences, setting aside this currency thing in a minute we'll talk about. Right? Yeah. The other possible is that sometimes you expect you might lose money on the board in one country and you want to take advantage of it. Right. So, I mean, that sounds great, right? You lose money in France and then you're like, I would like that loss again in the U.S. That sounds great. And so, um, People would check the box on entities that they think will flow through losses, right? Those losses can be like stock compensation, right? It may not even be a loss for French purposes, but in the U.S., using U.S. tax rules, that French entity will look like it's losing money. And so if you check the box and flow it through, you might get all that, that U.S. tax loss. Okay? I, I'm trying to work the term check the box. I listened to the, the Microsoft thing, and they kept on saying that check the box is basically causing us lots of grief, and we should ban check the box. Can you Elaborate on. I mean, I, I, I listened to it a couple times. Believe it or not, I mean, I'm an idiot too, and so I I didn't understand it. Could you elaborate? Okay, so hold that till like right after the break, and then we'll do free form stuff about the Microsoft reading, and then whatever else you want to talk about. Okay, so so this component three, U.S. tax on non-U.S. operations, and that example. It may just be an extra 1% on the profits of the foreign branch entity, right? Because my U.S. rate in this example is slightly higher than my foreign rate. But the key is that there's a whole calculation you've got to do, right? You've got to calculate your current provision in the U.S. that's attributable to these foreign operations. How much income came through? What are the perms? What are the temps? There's all kinds of things going on. And, and those aren't based on... on those aren't based on French rules, right? Those are based on U.S. rules. That was the weirdest cell phone ring I think I've ever heard. I thought it was an alarm. I thought it was a fire. <laughs> Anyways, um, so you have a whole calculation to do, right? You have, you have perms, temps, all based on U.S. tax rules that are attributable to this flow-through set of income and loss. And you have, you have deferreds, you have payables in the U.S., all attributable to this foreign branch flow-through. Okay? So there's a whole calculation that goes into that. And, um, <clears throat> and in a sense, foreign branch is, is taxed in two jurisdictions, right? It is, a, it is a dual tax resident. So it is tax resident in its country of France, in my example, and it's also a taxpayer in the U.S. And if the foreign tax credit system works, you pay tax at the higher of the two rates, right? In this example, the higher of the two rates is the 35%. Okay. All right, so that's component three. So component four is U.S. tax on investments. Okay, so when, when Lena was asking before about inside basis differences, I said in a second I would talk about outside. So when I mean outside, I mean this, right? When you look at USP, it's not subject to tax on Forco's earnings. Forco's earnings are offshore from a U.S. tax perspective, right? This is what Obama doesn't like, right? He, you have the money in Forco, and I mean this might be a low tax jurisdiction or high, but for our purposes, Forco is offshore. It is not in the U.S. tax net. Okay. And the way that US, um, the U.S. tax system is going to tax those profits is as if the profits of Forco, like let's say they made 100 pounds of, of profit, if they distribute that profit up to USP as a dividend, then USP is going to be taxed in the U.S. on that dividend income. Right. So what you read in the reading with Microsoft and what you have heard many times in this class already is that people don't make dividends. And if you watch the testimony, it was all about 
well, why don't you pay dividends back to the U.S.? And they try to politicize it, but the answer is, well, of course they don't want to pay U.S. tax, right? U.S. tax rates are really high, and if there's a way to not pay 35% on the dollar, I will pleasantly select that option, right? So, um, so when you think of USP in this example, they own Forco, and Forco's making money, and, and from a provision perspective, what you need to determine is whether there is an outside um, investment tax issue where you need to accrue today essentially in anticipation of those dividends, right? So if, for, if Forco made 100 pounds of profit, well, you may not distribute it today, and you may not pay U.S. tax today, but if you know you're going to distribute it and pay U.S. tax in the future, under the matching principle, you'll book that U.S. tax now, right? And you'll book some journal entry that might look like, you know, credit DTL for some number, which is a, I'm going to pay U.S. tax in the future, and debit tax expense. But companies don't want to do this, right? They don't want to book expense. And so if they can represent that their earnings are offshore and they're not coming back by way of a dividend, then they don't book that expense. Okay? And the whole testimony, um, particularly, in, particularly in the HP case, was around not booking that expense and whether that rule made sense, and that accounting rule, that is, and whether these temporary loans that the company was making from their foreign companies back to the U.S., whether that was violating the spirit of this rule that is basically meant to say if you keep your money offshore, you don't accrue U.S. tax. Okay. So, so pausing there, hopefully you see that when people talk about international taxes, those things are very different from each other. Right? All that nonsense with the U.K. person and uh, local financials and... That's completely different than this slide right here, dealing with the U.S. tax issues of repatriating, right? And so they are both international taxes, but they are nothing alike, right? They're two different groups of people working on it. They're two different tax systems that apply. Um, two completely different mechanical um, provision questions. So hopefully that, what turned out to be like 45 minutes of discussion, clarified when people say international taxes what they really mean. Okay? And don't hesitate. I mean, I don't get a commission for lecturing you, but don't, when you start talking to people about foreign provisions, don't hesitate to stop them and be like, which one of these are we talking about here? I want to make sure I'm completely clear on whether I'm talking about the UK provision, a flow through where it's dual, or just my outside basis, my repatriation effects. Which one? And then we focus on them one at a time. Don't try to conquer the world, right? Break it down into pieces and deal with it one at a time. Okay. Okay. Questions on that? Patty? Is there some part F that you had mentioned under component number three how um, they have temporary and firm differences that you apply to flow through? Does that apply always apply to the subpart F? I understood the, uh, my understanding is firm difference, but this makes it sound like timing, and you have, it, it, my question is also, is there two different categories for it under these four methods? Is there different treatment? Okay, just a second. Let's see if we, um, if I can just kind of freeform your question a little. <coughs> Okay, so in, in Patty's world, there's a U.S. company that has foreign sub. Foreign sub makes $100 of income. Let's say it has no tax liability. So it has $100 of profit. Okay, so let's say that's a Cayman company. And um, <clears throat> if, if, let's say of that 100, 20 of it is passive interest income and 80 of it is operating income like let's say you're selling jerk chicken sandwiches or something like that and making money in the Cayman Islands right? doing something that's real business 
So the US tax system would look at that 20 and say, well, that's not fair. Um, we don't want you just putting your money offshore earning interest income because if you could if you could keep that profit offshore, well, why don't you just put your whole bank account offshore and just not pay tax, right? I mean, it's such a mobile source of income that it's it's the kind of thing that we're going to earmark and say that's going to be taxed in the U.S. because of the nature of the underlying income, right? So, from a, for sub F, what sub F would say is, well, that twenty is a deemed dividend back to the U.S., right? And so, when you're doing your U.S. tax return or your U.S. provision, right? So, if we're doing we're these guys and we're doing our US provision we're gonna start with our US PBT and it's not gonna include Cayman's profit it's, the, it's just a US profit and we're gonna book perms and we're gonna book temps and we're gonna get to US taxable income and by the time we get here it's gonna include this 20 right because that 20 is taxed in the US by way of this deemed dividend rule. And the question is whether that's a perm or temp difference. And what I think Patty's saying is, I always hear that's a perm, right? And the reason that that's, a, is people phrase it as a perm is because they say, well, in general, none of these earnings are coming back to the US. I don't want to repatriate anything. I want to pay the least amount of tax possible I'm starting with my US gap income, which is only this guy. I don't ever want to pay tax on foreign sub if I can avoid it. And the only way I'm picking up any foreign sub income is if I have to. So that 20 will show up as a perm difference. Um, <clears throat> because as a general matter, US is not accruing any tax on this investment. Okay. If the U.S. had said, oh, you know what, all hundred of that's coming back someday. So on day one, I'll just book an entry, which is debit provision 35, credit DTL 35, because I know I'm going to pay 35 a tax on those earnings. If then you pick up sub F, then you would just reverse that temp in part. You would say, oh, you know what, when I have that sub F, I'll just debit my DTL for 7, which is 20 times 35% and I'll credit my payable. You know, I'll pay the US tax system seven. No one does it like that though, and the reason is that people are thinking that this thing is permanently reinvested. That's the, from a semantics perspective, that's, what peop that's why you hear what you hear. It's because they start with the expectation that the profits of the Forco are never coming back. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Okay, so this slide deals with terminology. I'm going to surely put you to sleep if I cover that slide. So um, the next section deals with, um, I mean, I guess in the last 45 minutes or so, we covered the basic components of provisions, and now we're just going to drill down into specific subsections. Okay. So this first subsection is really on that, um, that APB 23, or outside basis difference topic. Okay. And so we'll cover this, then we'll take our break, and this will be a good lead into the discussion around Microsoft and um, just the tension around the, that rule. Because of, of all the tax accounting rules that have um, political buzz, this is the one, right? Like it used to be, you know, 10 years ago, it used to be like, should people, should companies have to expense stock options, right? Is that a is that an appropriate thing to do or is that fair? And now there's a, there's a lot of similar buzz around this APB 23 rule. Like, should companies really not have to accrue U.S. tax expense on their foreign earnings? I mean, that is the underlying theme of that Levin testimony or hearings because they're trying to figure out, are companies um, inappropriately motivated to basically not return their money to the U.S. tax system because they would have to accrue that tax for financial statement purposes. I mean, that is a big part of this. And so um, it's an interesting question because as you do provisions, you have to wrestle with how to deal with it. But more than that, 
it's a political topic, and when um, when the presidential elections happened, the the two candidates had completely different visions on on how this ought to work. And let me just give you that background before we even go into um, into the material. So, if um, so, the current system. Okay, so I'm going to do like three worlds here, and you have to know this is coming like with my uh, strong political biases, and you can remove that for yourself. So at the moment, if you have U.S. and foreign sub, foreign sub is subject to foreign tax um, on foreign sub's profits, and then as profits come back, there's U.S. tax, okay? and that causes companies not to want to return money to the U.S. And so when you read a company like Microsoft's 10K, and if you read that um, Senate memo, it put in there a table of companies and how much their earnings, how many earnings they've accumulated offshore. It's a kind of a stunning number, right? And the reason they've do, they're doing that is they don't want to pay tax in the U.S. based on those dividends. You want to sit over there? Oh, in the front. We just have to clear off all our garbage. It's, it's no problem. There might even be like a rogue piece of cheesecake over there that you could uh, luck into. Lost there. So, so that's the system today, right? So, um, so we have a worldwide tax system, right? The U.S. policy is that you're going to be subject to U.S. tax on your worldwide profits. It's just a question of when, right? And the when is, in the case of foreign sub, is a function of when the earnings are returned to the U.S. Make sense? Okay. Under the um, under the Obama rules, he would basically say, again, these are completely my words, but he, he would say that we really need to strengthen the ability for companies to move stuff offshore, right? You know, when you listen to like the debate, so in fact, two of my, uh, one of my clients and my mother, after the first debate, asked me if they get a deduction for moving jobs offshore, because that's how it was characterized in the first debate. And one of my clients jokingly emailed, and he's like, next time you're out here, I want to talk about this deduction I get from moving offshore. It sounds like a good opportunity. <laughs> and if he was being sarcastic, right? But, um, you know, so when you listen to the Obama rules, he would say, look, by, by having this worldwide tax system in place where earnings, when they come back, are subject to U.S. tax, mm -hmm. that stops people from shifting all their money offshore because eventually they'll have to pay U.S. tax. And now what we need to do is we really need to figure out a way to, to disincentivize companies from moving stuff offshore in the first place, right? To make jobs more attractive here or to give companies tax breaks for doing certain things. And so that, that's his approach, right? And the, the Romney approach was uh, more of a European uh, line of thinking. And in Europe, they have uh, territorial tax systems. Uh, not across the board, but in large part. And so what happens there is uh, foreign sub is taxed on its foreign profits, and when the money comes back here, there's either, um, and it may not be U.S. in their case if this is Europe, but in a territorial tax system, there would be little or no um, incremental U.S. tax. And the idea would be now you're creating f free flow of money. Right? And so if you take all those companies that are cited in the Senate memo and you say, well, look, now you can move all that money back to the U.S., mm -hmm. and um, you, we're not going to charge you a lot of U.S. tax on that. So if you put your tax hat on, you would say, well, that's crazy. These guys are getting away with murder, <laughs> right? But if you put your I'm the treasurer uh, of the country hat on and say, well, it would be good if we injected like hundreds of billions of dollars into our economy, then if all those companies returned all that money to the U.S., that's what would happen, right? And so you have to def decide what political view you have in terms of what works, right? And you'd kind of like to think that there are smarter people that have figured this out who are better with economics than just the general population, right? But there's that debate as to whether having that free-flowing money is better for the economy at the end of the day or whether it's better to be more protectionist than have these, this high tax system in place. And um, when people talk about corporate tax reform, I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard that. Mm 
the what they mean for corporate tax reform in large part not in whole but in large part is this and so if you ask me that is dead that is i mean i can't even imagine that we're going to that in, in the obama world and again totally my my two cents um but now i think what you'll see out of budget proposals will be more of like this sort of thing and less of this wholesale reform where we adopt a completely different model um, but that's certainly what companies were thinking about when they would hear corporate tax reform. They would think, well, which one are we going to be in? And the one that they're going to end up in, at least in the middle column, at least if, that, if I'm right, is a lot like the one we have today. So it's not all that different. Well, wasn't he going to reduce the rate, though, too? He, he, the theory is that um, right now the rate is 35%, and we're like the second highest rate in the world. Yeah, everybody's dropping it. Everyone's dropping their rates, right? And so the idea was in the Romney plan, he wanted it to be 25, and I think he said 28. It's got to be higher to prove his point, right? And um, will the rate be 28? I mean, I'll bet you all the cheesecake on earth that uh, it's not going to be 28. <laughs> but I'm a skeptic. So, so who knows? But the, the real philosophical issue was not so much the tax rate as it was how to deal with these foreign earnings and how to manage companies. Because... If you take Microsoft and you say, well, the rate's not 35, it's 28, that's not going to change their mind, right? They don't want to pay 28 cents on the dollar. They don't want to pay 35 cents on the dollar. So that may not be true for every company, and that may not be true for Microsoft. I don't know. I don't speak for them. But you get the idea, right? If, they, if somebody gave you that opportunity and says, okay, fine, I won't, I won't tax you at 35%. I'll tax you at 28. But you know you can still maybe get away with none. You can be like, none looks good, right? Okay. Well, on the flip side, like countries like Ireland that was giving out at least tax free stuff coming to invest here, has that worked out for them? Um, that is a good question. So, um, what's. Because I mean, isn't it like Ireland and Cayman Islands? And uh, the Cayman Islands is a little different, but um, would a lot of countries like, a, like an Ireland or a Singapore or a Switzerland do mm -hmm. is they are not your sandy beach type countries, right? That just don't have taxes, period. Um, but what they basically do, and, and it's complicated, is you know, they'll, en they'll enter into a ruling process, and unless Ireland to some extent, but <clears throat> certainly Singapore's common, Switzerland's common. And they'll say, look, if you do certain things, we'll reduce your tax. Right, hire a certain number of people. There's a certain level of like technical sophistication. Um, then uh, we'll give you a tax break, right? And so they've chosen like the complete opposite approach that we have from a tax system in terms of how to uh, work their economy. But every country is different, right? They have n different natural resources. They have different like attributes that they can offer. Um, I mean, a country like. Um, a, uh, a Switzerland, I mean, the companies that are headquartered there are headquartered there because of the tax incentives, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't be headquartered there otherwise. And you have to wonder whether having them headquartered there is a net good thing or not. I don't know. Um, but taxes are the reason that, that they're there. The thing about Ireland, though, or Singapore is that compared to Switzerland, there's kind of manufacturing actually done there. So there's other incentives. Sort of, you actually got work being there done there too so as far as helping the countries out it has been to both I've been in Ireland I mean I would say that definitely doing that helps the countries out as far as bringing a lot of wealth into the country right but if you said hey would the U.S. go to the system and would it change the dynamic of the economy I don't know it's so drastic I can't it's not even imaginable I mean look how difficult it is to change like any rule in Congress right Well, but we're, we're, you know, apparently we're going to have some money problems. Like yeah, future tense, huh? We don't have current money problems. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's just talk a little bit about outside basis differences. So, okay, so the fact pattern is I'm a U.S. company. I own a foreign sub, right? I'm Microsoft. I have a lot of operations offshore. I have lots of foreign subs. And... Um, now I need to figure out if my investment in that foreign company is something I care about from a tax accrual perspective. Do I want to accrue taxes related to that investment? And 
at the end of the day, people are going to ask, do I need to calculate a deferred tax liability? Mm -hmm. Right? And that, that's a big deal. <clears throat> people will often um, confuse terms here, but when somebody says APB 23, this is the main term I want you to think about. If they say the words, I'm APB 23, oops, that basically means that they are permanently reinvested, which is code for, I'm not bringing my foreign profits back to the U.S., I'm not accruing tax on that foreign profits, and whether you define that profit as either a basis difference, meaning I have a book basis in my stock of the foreign sub and I have a tax basis in the shares, so I, therefore I have a basis difference when I look at the shares of the sub. Or sometimes people characterize it as I have unremitted earnings. Or sometimes people say I have E and P, which is kind of the tax equivalent of earnings. In theory, all three of those things I just highlighted could be the same. They might be different. The, the accounting rules deal with basis difference. So if you are U.S. and you have foreign sub, this thing right here is an asset, right? This stock is an asset. And it has a book basis and it has a tax basis. And the difference between those two basis amounts is a basis difference, a temporary item, just like depreciation or bad debt. And But for this APB 23 exception, you would book a tax effect of that. And all APB 23 says is if you have a difference, we still don't care because you'll never realize it. Okay? But in general, you think, what is the asset? It's the stock in my sub. I have a book basis and a tax basis. Now, do I care if there's a difference? And the answer will depend on whether you're APB 23. Okay? Does that make sense? It is rare that when you talk to companies about their offshore profits that they will um, define it that way. They, when you're talking to companies or you read their financial statements, they're not talking about the basis difference they have in their shares of their foreign subs. They will use the term unremitted earnings. And, and the, reason that, um, the reason that it can be the same is, um, let's use this example. So parent owns sub, and the book basis is a million five, and the tax basis is a million, so there's a difference of 500,000. And remember, when we do deferred tax accounting, we always think, well, what would happen if you sold this asset for book value? Well, if you sold this asset for book value, you would have a half a million dollar tax gain. So that would tell you you need a DTL. And so we would book a DTL unless we could say that we were permanently reinvested and therefore didn't need a DTL. And the reason that in this example that you might have a basis difference between book and tax is, is simple equity accounting. Okay. So let's do a, a simple equity accounting example. This might be like really pedantic. Okay. Oh my gosh, I don't even know how I did that. <coughs> Okay, so let's say that you have U.S. and foreign sub, and on day one, you put down a million dollars of cash, okay? Your book basis in that thing, in that stock, is going to be a million. Your tax basis, a million. For book purposes, when you make a half a million dollars of profit, Okay, you have a half million dollars of profit. For tax, nothing happens. The fact that you made profit in your foreign sub of a half million dollars, that has no impact on your tax basis in the shares. Okay, it's just not relevant. So your tax basis in this thing is still a million dollars. But from a book perspective, the basis goes up. So your book basis is now a million five. Okay. And the reason is, is that at this level, they book an entry, which is debit the investment 
per 0.5. Credit equity earnings, 0.5. And so these guys are booking an entry locally, which is debit, cash, 0.5, credit, income, 0.5. They book that entry, we book this, and then in consolidation somewhere, um, there's going to be an, be an elimination entry where the equity earnings will be eliminated and the investment will be eliminated. Okay, And that's all going to happen in some eliminations company. But the theory is that this gets booked by the parent. And when they book this, it increases the investment for book purposes so that now, whatever this book investment is, it should equal the equity of foreign sub. Foreign sub's equity is the million of cash it got plus the half million it earned. So U.S.'s investment should be the same as the foreign equity. There should be parity. Okay. So that is how... When you think of unremitted earnings, if, if I say, well, what's this company's unremitted earnings? You would say this. And if I said, well, what's the basis difference? Well, you would say the difference here, which is also this. It's the same thing. That's in a very simple example. They are not always the same. Okay? But the point is that when I say basis difference, it could be mechanically we're talking about the same thing. So this slide is a diagram that talks a bit about the different things that can affect book and tax basis. And based on the look on your eyes, this is uh, beyond the scope of what we were going to cover then. Okay. What's that? Oh, no, that's a good idea. Thank you. Okay, let's actually take a break while my... Uh, so we'll take our break now, and I'm going to have you fill out the surveys during break, and then I'll recharge the video thing. Uh, while we're doing that.